Okay, our next speaker doesn't need any uh, own, uh, very own uh, uh, trend. Uh, he is the fastest thinking person and the fastest talking person I ever <laughs> met. <laughs> so be prepared. Uh, it's a great honor to have you, uh, Trent. Uh, please go to Thanks. Uh, so as a bit of background, um, you know, uh, we've been organizing this meetup now for a few years, and you know, I took it over from um, Andy and Daniel. Daniel's back now, so welcome back, Daniel, if you're here. Is he here? Is he here? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, though, uh, ever since I, I've been co-organizing this um, with uh, Daniel and Andy and then Abhishek and Adrian, um, we, we don't like to get caught. We like to hedge our risks, so I always have a backup of slides of a talk to give. And that way, even if we have two cancellations any given night, we always have a talk. And tonight, uh, today actually, at first it was looking like we even had two cancellations. So I have a talk that was actually in backup for two and a half years, ready to go. And, um, and then I, I started thinking about it, and then Adrian came through and we, we lined up uh, one of the backups, which is cool. But I realized, you know, given that this has been around and it's kind of gathering dust, um, although it's actually based on research even older than that, it's worth giving you guys this talk because I think it's a pretty cool topic. Um, has nothing to do with blockchains um, or deep learning, really. Actually, a bit deep learning. Um, and as you know, most of a lot of my work this, these days is blockchain related. So um, instead, I'm going to go into something that most of the AI world itself doesn't even really know much about. But it's actually, think of it like this it's a new Jedi tool for you as AI practitioners, as optimization practitioners, that I'll, will allow you to get to radical scale. All right? So, uh, top down, bottom up, a survey of hierarchical design methodologies. And I, I acknowledge that's a mouthful. It's, that's just a label that's been around. Um, but let's get going. So, I, I need to, to set this up though with some context, right? So, first of all, um, you know, throw a rock and you'll find a different definition of AI by a different AI practitioner, right? Um, but rather than argue over what AI actually is and stuff, there are some pragmatic views to view it ways to do it. So for example, you know, there's the problem of classification, right? Um, where maybe you have a bunch of previous samples of, of people who have different ages and different salaries, and based on the experience of whether or not they paid their bills or didn't, their credit card bills, you can construct a model to discern, determine um, anyone else coming in who applies for a credit card, what is the probability of them paying their bills? And you can have a classifier, right? So this line here is just a classifier. It's a binary classifier of, you know, are they going to pay their bills or not? That's a very straightforward application, right? In fact, a lot of the work that we see in machine learning with deep learning and stuff is all about just classification. Usually more than two dimensions as inputs, you know, it could be 200 or even um, 2 million, but that's classification. Regression um, is another um, use case for AI, right? Where in this case, rather than trying to have a binary valued output, zero or one, you've got, in this case, one input dimension, right? Um, in this case, age, and then the output in this case is job satisfaction. You've got a few samples from before, and um, the green dots, and what you try to do is simply fit a curve to this, right? And that's a continuous value curve. That's simply regression. Very straightforward, right? And by the way, this isn't just AI, of course. It's lots of other fields from, you know, linear models to polynomials, splines, neural networks, whatever, right? So this example here is two inputs, one output, right? So it looks, it's a surface. So we've got salary and age coming in. And then a model that's predicting the job satisfaction coming out, right? And, um, you know, there are so many techniques that have been developed over the years, over the last 50, 60, 70 years for this. I mentioned a few. We've also got, you know, Gaussian process models, which, by the way, are really great for up to 20 dimensions. Um, boosted trees, all these sorts of things, right? And by the way, it's kind of amazing in the world of deep learning, um, often people forget about these other techniques. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2001, SVMs were all the rage. You open up any um, AI journal, and 75% of the articles are on support vector machines, right? And then about five years later, it was nothing but random forests, you know. And um, you know, our, our very own Abhishek here, he was actually is a Jedi at random forests, and he was winning all these Kegel, and getting second place in all these Kegel competitions, right? So there are there are trends in, in AI these days. The trend is deep learning, but you know, there are going to be shifts here and there and here and there. And even though there is trends. There's always um, handfuls of researchers that continue pushing it, pushing it, pushing it in whatever their sort of pet domains are, right? That's where we got deep learning from, right? Hinton had been pushing on this since uh, the early 80s and before. Uh, symbolic regression. This is another problem um, where it's kind of like regression, but in this case, 
um, you got, you get um, the output like before, but you also get a white box model, something that you can look at and analyze it, right? So here, the, the model says y equals 50.2 plus 9.1 times x plus 3.2 times max of 0 x and x squared, right? So you can look at this and analyze. You're like, okay, I've got, it's a linear function of it, and it's also got a, a quadratic term that's clipping at zero. Cool, that's really useful to analyze, right? Whether you're trying to predict stocks, whether you're trying to design analog circuits, et cetera, right? So these are examples of subproblems. Now there's actually a whole bunch more, right? I talked about classification, uh, regression, and white box regression, right? And each of these has uses for everything from fraud detection to stock prediction to scientific discovery, right? There's actually a bunch of other fields too, right? Uh, sort of different ways, a toolbox of ways to solve. So optimization for everything from airfoils to circuits, uh, structural synthesis, sort of automated creative design, um, pattern recognition, system identification, ranking, control, right? So you can view AI as this field that has a whole bunch of tools to solve these problems. And it's not the only way, right? You can use classical um, techniques too, like linear algebra in many cases, or control systems theory. So there's overlap. Now, some of these fields, um, there's a whole bunch of subfields of AI, right? You can view it as this um, group of, of techniques where um, it's still a bit of an art. And once it becomes sort of really easy to apply and stuff, you put it in a MATLAB and it's just solved, right? You know, when you want to do um, matrix inversion, you just, in MATLAB, you do X over Y, right? Or in Python, you, you apply the inversion um, uh, command and you're good to go, right? But with, with neural networks, it takes, it's a bit of an art form, right? There's tweaking and tweaking that need to be done. So with this, we've got a bunch of subfields where you still need to usually tweak, right? Machine learning, neural networks, evolutionary computation, a whole bunch, right? Um, by the way, nonlinear programming used to be considered a subfield of AI, but it's gotten good enough now, right, that you can just run it. These are, they solve quadratic functions, right? Even databases were once considered AI, right? But now they are sufficiently advanced technology that you can just run them and they just work, right? And this is actually starting to happen with neural networks too, right? So deep learning said, let's bring more data and more compute to solve problems we were trying to solve before. What happened? It improved the UX for the problems that neural networks are trying to solve, right? So um, it's not perfect yet because people keep trying to solve bigger and bigger problems, but you know, it's all ImageNet now, it's an off-the-shelf thing, it's easy. So now in these subfields, they even have their own subfields. So in the subfield of machine learning and neural networks, We've got things like recurrent neural networks, sparse linear regression, deep learning, and many others, right? Could go on and on. Um, other AI subfields are the same. So within evolutionary computation, we've got evolutionary programming and evolution strategies. That's when you want to have survival of the fittest, when the, the individual, the design point, is a vector of continuous values, or genetic algorithms. That's when you have a bit string, a vector of binary values, right? or genetic programming. Genetic programming is an extra cool one because you're actually searching a space of computer programs, right? So here you have this super general algorithm, survival of the fittest, evolution. You can't really get much more general than that. And you also have basically evolving these Turing complete machines, computer programs, right? So I really love genetic programming actually. It's, it's one of my very, very favorite fields in all of computer science and AI because of that. It's so general. And also, um, the problems that people are, are looking at attacking is just super interesting. So, um, you know, now what is it, um, genetic programming? I mentioned it's um, leveraging this idea of evolution, right? Darwin's um, evolution, survival of the fittest. And um, if you do a Google search for evolution, um, this was actually from a couple of years ago, I guess now, but I did a search and we have all the classic pictures you'd expect, but I have no idea what showed up here. Like this is the very first thing. It's actually WWE. This is World Wrestling something, I think. So I, that, maybe that's you know the evolution or something. I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, any wrestling fans. Um, and uh, of course, there's lots of jokes here in here too. So we've got the Tomb Raider evolution by the looks of it. So lots of fun stuff. Um, so overall, the idea of evolution is very simple, right? You've got replication uh, of individuals. Um, then they mutate, they change, they cross over, and then the ones who do well, um, they get selected and move on, right? Um, you could even summarize evolution as um, the least fit die. That's all you need to do. You can have 95% of the population just keep doing its thing, keep doing its thing, and every generation, 1%, 5% just die, and you will have convergence over time, right? So um, that is really the general idea of evolution. I won't get into it in detail. Uh, by the way, you can write an evolutionary algorithm in 10 lines of Python code. 
And of course, there's probably a hundred libraries out there now in various languages, probably a thousand even. Um, so what can you do with evolution? Um, genetic programming. Uh, one of my favorites is what you see here. This is uh, an antenna that was evolved by uh, a couple friends of mine in NASA um, more than 10 years ago now. Uh, and uh, this antenna is really interesting. Before it was designed, the classic way to design an antenna was to have a single rod that goes straight up and then have some sort of fancy black art uh, way of designing a, a PCB, a printed circuit board. And um, there was big, thick manuals that were like a thousand pages long, long on the art of RF design of these antennas. So along came my friends, um, Greg and Jason, and they just started evolving these things, which are literally bent paper clips. That's actually their first prototypes. And um, they actually beat every single antenna in production for this particular problem. What problem was this? Well, it's NASA, of course, so this is actually for rockets going up in space. And in fact, within a couple of years, these evolved antennas did go up into space. And, and now they're just part of a standard design process for NASA and JPL engineers. Jason uh, started a company a couple of years later and has been running uh, strong for 10 years. So um, evolution at its best, and in, uh, in this case for antenna design. There, the field of genetic programming has a whole variety of cool and interesting ideas, you know. How do we get a computer to know what to do? Uh, you know, the Humi Awards where you're trying to compete against humans. This is long before these recent things where Facebook is out competing humans for um, you know, face recognition and stuff. Genetic programming was doing this in the early 2000s. Not for face recognition, for other cool stuff. And a lot of it is around creative design, right? So do you think that you've got a lock on creativity just because you're human? Sorry. Now, um, in, in genetic programming, to give you a feel of what it's about, right? Um, you've, one, one thing you might do, I, I mentioned before, symbolic regression, right? So it's like regression. But instead, you actually want to spit out a function um, that you can see. So you have a tree, um, and you know you can say this is a computer program, or you can just call it a tree. And then basically what you do is you, you randomly generate a bunch of these trees. Each one is a function, right? So here, we've got f of x equals 4.8, 4.8 times x3 plus square root of x2, right? So this all gets parsed, and this is the model, right? In this case, it's just, um, well, at least um, two variables, x2 and x3. Of course, you'd have an x1. and um, then it basically, you, you do survival of the fittest. You do the initial population, you evaluate them, you create children, and you keep iterating, iterating, right? And of course, they can um, traverse the space. When you create children, you can have parent A and parent B make baby one and baby two, right? Very straightforward. This is an example of crossover. It's actually interpolation in this um, tree-valued space, right? That's what's happening. Um, so when you have this, you can have, um, Plain old vanilla GP, like John Cosa did in 1991, he's um, basically the, the popularizer of the field. Um, and this, in this case, this is actually Lisp code. Um, John really likes Lisp, and uh, so he's evolving all these functions, like you know, R log of cos of x and so on. And uh, he was actually trying to maximize the complexity, so he was actually getting some that were like a page long in some cases, although um, they were solving just very simple problems. Um, and then uh, I actually did a bit of work on this too about 15 years ago myself and um, modeling things like circuits here. So if this is an electrical circuit, it's an operational transconductance amplifier. It, it amplifies signals, okay? So it's like a speaker. Um, so uh, basically in goes the, um, the output, like, sorry, in goes inputs um, and you want to amplify what comes out there. And if you want to have the expression for how much it amplifies, that's what this is. It's a function of various currents and voltages um, around the circuit, right? And you can model not only the gain, but also um, unity gain frequency, um, the phase margin, all these other performance parameters of a circuit. Just like a car has top speed and, and fuel efficiency, well, circuits have the same thing, right? Power consumption, gain, and so on. So basically, this is an example of applying genetic programming to modeling. You can even go further. Um, because they come from circuit land, right? Um, you can actually start to synthesize circuits. So rather than just trying to analyze them, you can say, let's automatically design an analog circuit. And remember, normally to be an analog circuit engineer, you go to four years of electrical engineering school, and then um, if you want to get really good, you're going to go do a PhD, which will take you another four or five years, right? So you're talking, you know, eight years, nine years, ten years to get really good at analog design, right? Um, and they are also considered artists, uh, rightfully so. But imagine if someone came along to you and said, you know what you're doing? I've got an AI that can do this instead of you. 
And you know, um, and that's actually what John Cosa did initially in a paper from 2001. Actually, it was even earlier. I think it was 1999. Um, and basically, this is uh, a particular uh, circuit that he evolved, and um, it was actually quite comparable to some other circuits. Um, a little weird in some places, but a start, right? So, automated creative design of engineering circuits. Um, this circuit and some of John's other work had some issues. So, I'm because I'm an electrical engineer, I played around myself a bit. And in 2005, I came up with a way of giving trustworthy black construction circuits. So um, you could synthesize these engineering designs that you could just trust. They would just work. Why? Because they had the right constraints. They, they leveraged the knowledge of the field. And you can see they actually look a little bit more sane than some of John's stuff. Um, and well, maybe you can't tell because probably none of you are analog engineers. But um, if you are an analog engineer, then you'd be like, hey, that's a cool circuit. I know that one. And this, the, the system came up with this itself. Um, and of course, you know, I mentioned before um, uh, the, the antenna. Another example from my friend Greg, one of the antenna guys, was jewelry. So he was doing this about uh, five or six years ago. He was synthesizing jewelry for fun. He's like, why stop at antennas? Let's make some pretty things. So what he had was basically he had a website called Orbini, and it was Earth's largest jewelry store. So what you would do, you would go in there, and it would show you um, this. This is actually a screenshot from Orbini. And um, whatever, all of these are randomly generated. If you like one of them, you click on it, and it will give you 10 variants of it. You click on one of those, it'll give you 10 more variants. And it actually had billions and billions and billions of variants, right? Any single one of these that you order, you click order, and it would go on 3D print the thing and send it to you by mail. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, Greg decided, he almost made a campaign to this, but in the end he, he joined Facebook. But uh, I still, I, 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 I think him about it. But anyway, that is um, basically a synthesis of jewelry. The point is, you can use genetic programming for creative design whether it's something that's more along the creative art spectrum or for engineering. Okay. So I've talked about genetic programming and more broadly optimization. And, I, and then also the idea of creative design and so on, right? Um, but what I've showed you so far, if you think about it, they were all pretty small, right? You know, you look back to this. It's, it's just uh, not that much complexity, right? And these circuits that I showed you before, they had maybe seven components, 10 components, 12 components, right? Or those functions, you know, maybe maybe five variables, ten variables, twenty variables, maybe you know, fifteen terms max, right? But what about trying to get bigger? What about scaling, right? And any of you who does any sort of engineering or AI work, you, as you know, scale matters. We you know in the blockchain world too, scale really matters. Um, so you know, it's one thing to think about automatically designing a piston, right? It's pretty simple, not that much complexity. Even if you look at it, you can probably imagine how to parameterize the thing, right? But what about automatically designing a car, right? What then, right? How are you going to evolve a car? A car has got not just five or seven components. I didn't even, I haven't even counted. I don't even know how you count, but at least a thousand, maybe even ten thousand parts, right? Probably Elon Musk knows because he's probably comparing Teslas to Mercedes, right? So, um, so let's say five thousand parts, right? So how do you evolve a, a, a part, a car with five thousand parts? And here's all the parts, right? That's going to be quite a stretch for um, any optimization or synthesis algorithm. It doesn't matter if it's genetic programming or anything. Um, it's just a big stretch. Or um, the next one, circuit design, right? So um, if you think about modern chips, they have 10 billion transistors on them. A single chip um, inside your phone will have 10 billion transistors. The GPUs that you're running for your deep learning, 10 billion transistors or more, right? So how do you evolve a design that comes up with 10 billion transistors? Right? Design teams do it. You can have a design team of 10 or 50 engineers, and they're able to design a chip with 10 billion transistors in a matter of months with 10 people. But can you even conceive of how an AI could do that? Or what about animals, right? Um, I, um, I, I looked it up, and um, an animal has, like, like humans, has 37 trillion cells, right? So 37 trillion building blocks at the level of the cell, right? How do you evolve that, right? So you might say, well, what if we try to approach the design flat? We just look at it and we try to basically run around and optimize and randomly connect these cells and hope that they morph into some Neanderthal man or hope that they morph into uh, some smart car, right? Well, that's actually what most of optimization design does, right? When you run a neural network training, you're actually running optimization flat, 
right? Whether it's you know ten hit, um, hidden layers or ten thousand hidden layers, right? Um, but that actually doesn't scale, right? Um, with deep learning, we're actually getting away with it more than before, just thanks to Moore's law, right? Because every eighteen months, we get actually double the, the amount of compute, right? So fifty years with the Moore's law um, is what actually made all the difference for AI for neural networks, right? The algorithms themselves aren't much different than the nonlinear perceptrons of the early 60s. What's changed is Moore's law, right? 50 years of storage, 50 years of compute, and 50 years of data gathering, right? Um, so that's how we've got there with, with Moore's law. However, what if you actually have your deep learning and it's taking you a data train, but you need a model that's 10x bigger? You just see this. Or what about 1,000? Are you going to run your, your model for training for a thousand days? Right. What if there's another way? And of course, this isn't just for deep learning, right? This is for a car or a circuit. Right. Well, I, I talked about how do they design circuits. You know how they designed the shuttle? It was actually top-down design. So basically, uh, some super high up person, probably even the president, I suppose, said, okay, we want a, a shuttle, a reusable like vehicle, right? And then a bunch of engineers explored a bunch of uh, very, very top level designs of like wings and different ways of holding fuel and rockets and so on, and they settled on one higher level design. And then within each, each of those components, they said, okay, we've got this massive thing right below the belly of the shuttle that stores the fuel. We need to design the details of that. And they drilled in and they designed the details and the sub-details and the sub-details. They did the same thing for the shuttle itself, right? So they drilled down and drilled down at, at, at each level. They, they said, okay, I've got the design of, say, roughly the cockpit, but what about um, the computers in the cockpit? And inside the computers, what about the specific chips? And so on, right? So the, the space shuttle um, was actually designed from the top down, wildly, wildly complex. So this is a, a way to approach design of very complex systems from the top downwards. And I will elaborate on this more, but this is just one of the ways. Um, circuits themselves have higher, right? So if you look at this circuit, this is a very simple amplifier. It's actually got three or four levels of hierarchy, if you want. Right? Bottom-up design, right? So um, it, we, with evolution, with other things, we, we've learned about life that started single-celled organisms. Um, so how did it get from single-celled all the way to these organisms like us that have 37 trillion cells. What does that look like? And the answer, as I've hinted, is hierarchy, right? Um, so it's hierarchy is a way to bring method to the madness. But what are the key tricks? Divide and conquer. Specifically, you divide, and then you conquer, you solve each subpiece on, on its own, and then you stitch it back together, right? And interestingly then, so if we've got this hierarchy here where there's the overall system, and it's got a bunch of subblocks, and each subblock is a bunch of other subblocks, and so on and so forth. Here's the cool thing. This is maybe the key thing. The difficulty of solving for this overall system is only as hard as the difficulty of solving for one of these blocks. So whichever is the hardest block, that's roughly the difficulty of solving for the system. right? And essentially, you've got log scaling on the rest. So log scaling overall, and it's just basically the difficulty of just one of the blocks. So um, if you want to apply a hierarchical design methodology, whether it be something top down or something bottom up, um, then you actually have to follow a particular recipe, right? You need three things. You need a way to estimate the performance of each block, and I'll talk about that. So this block here, if I have a particular design um, of, say, a circuit, what is its power consumption? What is its gain? Right? I need a way to search that sub-block, and what does that mean? If I'm designing a car, I need to be able to wiggle the diameters of the wheels and to um, wiggle the, the, the size of the engine, and from that, estimate um, what the, the fuel consumption is, etc. And finally, I need a way to stitch together the blocks. So let's say I've got um, an, an internal combustion engine, I've got tires, I've got an interior, and I need to stitch these all together into a larger car. Right? And within a tire, I've got different sub-pieces. Right? So if I have these three things, a way to estimate performance for each block, a way to search each block, and a way to stitch them together, then I can start to approach hierarchical design. So I talked about performance, right? So basically, we've got a circuit or some other block. In go the inputs, um, and out go the outputs, in, um, basically. And you have some sort of model. So in the case of circuit land, um, let's say I've got an op-amp, like I showed you before. 
I have to have things like the resistor values, the transistor widths and lengths, and so on. I run a circuit simulator like SPICE. It's solving some dynamical uh, system differential equations. And, and then it outputs, for example, what the gain is or the power consumption, right? And uh, this is more general too. You know, circuits aren't the only uh, field that have simulators. We've got simulators for automotive design, for airfoil design, and all of this, right? And that's and all of them at the very, very core, they're solving a system of differential equations. There's other ways to do it too, but that's usually the way to do it. So overall, um, it turns out, in, if you're trying to solve, do hierarchical design, there's actually quite a few different approaches. I hinted at them, right? I talked about flat. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about some others. I'm going to talk about top-down design, but a very particular variant, which is actually basically the only real structured way to do top-down, and it's called constraint-driven design. And once I talk about those, I will talk about uh, bottom-up. So in top-down design, you start off with constraints at the very, very top. And I hinted at this before, right? It's like the president says, we need a reusable space launch vehicle, right? Let's call it the space shuttle, right? Boring as a bus on purpose, right? Um, and then basically these constraints go to the system, and then what happens is, um, let's see here. So basically the, the engineers um, or the algorithm runs and runs and runs and tries to solve for that design saying, okay, it's got to be able to get into space, it's got to be able to land slowly enough so that it doesn't crush the astronauts and a few other things, right? And um, it comes up with an a, a design, right? And then with that design, it says, uh, you've got, it, that design specifies sub-blocks. For example, it might say, we need rocket boosters that have a particular minimum thrust, right? So I don't even know what it is in rockets, but thousands and thousands of um, pound-feet of thrust, for example, right? And uh, we might say the maximum weight has to, um, can be no greater than X kilograms, right? So basically, you've got your higher level design, and it's giving constraints on the lower levels, right? And you just keep going and going with that. So you actually then come up with each of the different sublevels. And then with each sublevel as well, you just keep going, right? So with the rocket boosters, for example, you go lower and you say, okay, with the rocket booster, they need they have particular um, maximum amount of fuel that they can store, and, and other sorts of things, right? So you just keep going and going. And in the end, uh, in the end, basically you have a design where you've basically specified all the way down, um, down to the last nut, down to the last bolt, down to the last transistor, what that design is. And once you have that, then you can actually go bottom up, just to verify, saying, okay, um, I want to verify that I've got the right nuts and bolts set up in this in this rocket or um, in the piston of this car. And then one level up, I want to make sure that I've got my engine well specified, the internal combustion engine. It's hitting, um, I'm verifying with the simulator that it's hitting, say, 300 horsepower, um, say, 400 pound-feet of torque, you know, let's get a Viper or something in there, right? And then at the very, very top level, um, you have your overall car that meets your overall goals, right? Um, and this is really constraints at this top level, right? So going down, you're trying to estimate performance kind of roughly. Coming up, you're verifying that it's, it's good. So this is basically, here we go. So what I talked about to start with was um, this approach for top-down design, where um, traditionally it's actually been really hard to do because you actually have to have your own manually created model of everything going downwards, right? Think about like uh, the space shuttle designers, right? They're trying to design this um, rocket booster, right? That, um, you know, the two rocket boosters that go on the side of the fuel tank, um, but they had never designed that before, so they were basically trying to come up with manual equations for it, right? Um, so that's actually really hard to do. Um, and it's hard to be accurate then, and therefore it's hard to verify that the design is good. This is actually part of the reason that the space shuttle design took so long. Right? But um, there's another way to do it, and that is um, you can start at the bottom with known designs and then model the feasibility. And what this means is the following. So imagine the very, very bottom, you say, okay, I've got um, a piston, and it's only it's going to have a weight of one kilogram, right? And I've got uh, the camshaft related to the piston, and it's got a weight of two kilograms, right? And you combine all these together, and you end up here with your internal combustion engine, right? And so on and so forth. And basically, if you know that you have these parts beforehand, you can model them bottom up, um, and then you can propagate that higher and higher and higher, such that by the time you get to the top, you know it's possible without actually having to have these very, very rough estimates. 
And uh, so overall, basically, that is, so overall, this is basically a way to, once again, come at the top-down uh, constraint-driven design, but simply in a more um, pragmatic way, in a more accurate way. Right? So I'm going to talk about bottom-up design in a second, but there's another design that's actually really interesting. right? And the idea is, what if you do actually optimize it all at once, but not flat? Now, what does that mean? It sounds kind of strange, right? Bottom up and top down, or what? And the idea is, imagine you have some sort of model at the system level, and it's not super high fidelity there, but then you have, so maybe a simulator of a car, but it's super high level. And then simulators of the engine of the car and of the seats and so on. And then one level below, simulators of the piston and the camshaft and so on, right? And what you're doing is, you're wiggling um, the piston designs here to try to meet the constraints here. You're, you're wiggling the designs of the engine here to try to meet the constraints of the car. So you're wiggling at kind of each level, but any given sub-level is actually cheap enough to simulate on its own. And that's kind of the key trick. So it's actually chunked the space into trying to solve each of these on its own, but overall, it doesn't have the super, super high cost of simulation. Because once again, remember, if you try to, say, you design a car all at once, simulating that car in super high detail is just way, way too expensive, right? So by doing this approach, you've, you've actually got the detail at the lowest, lowest levels, um, yet reconciling it with very fast optimization at the system level. Right? Um, maybe to relate this to, to deep learning, um, you might actually be saying, we're going to optimize for, let's say, an LSTM model. right? So inside an LSTM, you've actually got this memory circuit. right? And it's got a particular wiring of, uh, of, of well, ways to store memory in a particular way. But what if you let its wiring change a, bit of, a, a little bit here, a little bit there, depending on where it's placed? So you do that wiring there. And at the same time, you're modeling um, one level higher up, which is maybe a group of, say, five or ten hidden layers. And at the very top, you're modeling the overall network. And in this case here, you are trying to um, basically minimize the, the mean squared error or whatever. So that would be an example for the world of deep learning. So I've talked about top-down. Um, I've talked about concurrent. Uh, what about bottom-up, right? So bottom-up, basically, it starts at the bottom and it goes up, right? And this is actually how most engineering design has happened over the last 100 years. Um, if you think about, say, um, most, say, aircraft design, right? Um, 100-ish years ago, we had the Wright brothers. And they were actually even building on some designs from before. They're like, OK, um, there's already these kites out there. There's already a few people trying other stuff. We're going to take one of these designs, riff on it. And they started with basically fabric from the kites. They had wood and so on, um, otherwise. And then at the same time, uh, they said, OK, we've got this building block called the internal combustion engine, which had just recently been invented. They actually had to tweak it a bit in order to be simpler, um, because it was the traditional ones were for cars, and they were too heavy, um, and, and some other building blocks. So, so they basically took existing building blocks. They tweaked them a bit here and there and here and there, and assembled them to a higher and higher level design. right? And ever since then, uh, with the airplanes, there's been an evolution here and there and here and there. Uh, for example, um, a, few, a few years after the Wrights came along, uh, the ailerons were invented. And this was a, a more flexible way to, um, to control. So instead of the wing warping that the Wrights use, kind of like stretching a kite, you could actually just bend the wing directly um, at, with ailerons, right? So that was a new building block that was invented. And basically, the way that bottom-up design and engineering works over time, there's sort of a set of building blocks for a field, right? Ailerons, um, internal combustion engines, all these sorts of things, right? And they kind of evolve and improve over time. And if you improve one building block in one place, you might be able to have a way better design, right? And that's basically what people are doing, and that's what you do with bottom-up design. You just assemble the things that are already there into one overall system, right? When the creator of the Oculus Rift created the Rift, he actually didn't have to invent everything. He just assembled some off-the-shelf components to build the Rift, right? And then after that, you know, they got bought for a billion dollars and they tweaked this and they tweaked that to make it better, better, better. Right? So the idea of multi-objective bottom-up design is taking this idea and formalizing it, right? And what it's doing is saying, I'm going to actually make models of the performance trade-offs of these lowest levels, right? So what is the trade-off for air airplanes, say? Um, what is the trade-off of propellers? Um, the weight of the propeller, the, the speed that can handle and so on, right? And not just propellers, but also the ailerons and so on. And then one level up with, with the wings and, and the cockpit, all the way up to the level of the airplane. So you model going up, and you get a trade-off up for the propeller between, say, weight and speed. right? And higher up, too, for an engine, say, you might get the trade-off um, between weight and um, fuel consumption, 
and um, horsepower, right? So you, you have trade-offs all the way up, and the cool thing is, once you solve here to get this trade-off, and here to get this, you combine them into this bar, <coughs> and you get this trade-off here. <coughs> you get the trade-offs for each of these, and you pull them all the way to the top, right? And so once you have the trade-off for any block, you no longer have to go back and optimize that thing, right? And neural networks, once you have your trade-offs for your LSTM designs model, you don't need to go back and model them again. You know, right? So some of them might take more um, plots. Some of them might have better memory. Some of them might have more compute. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. I'll get there. We're almost done. So, um, so basically, this is the idea of bottom-up design. And um, it's basically, like mentioned, it is a structured approach to do what we've been doing for 100 years <coughs> with engineering design corporal. Uh, as an example, uh, yeah, let's see here. So here's an example for a circuit, right? So at the very, very lowest level, uh, we've got all these fancy circuits, like this one you saw before, the Miller OTA. But there's other ones, like this CAS code OTA, a symmetric OTA, a bunch of stuff you guys have probably no idea of. But here's the thing, right? You combine these together into um, one level up and then one level up. And at the very, very top level, you get, in this case, it's an ADC, uh, an analog to digital converter, right? So each of these things here is actually one of these building blocks, right? And then this thing here, it's another building block from over here. That's these, right? So this is an example where you can kind of peek inside and see the whole structure for the design. And so the amazing thing is, rather than trying to optimize this whole thing flat, all I did was actually it optimized for the full trade-off of this circuit, the full trade-off of this circuit, the full trade-off of this. Same thing over here for the DAX and so on. And then at this level, it had way less work to do. So the, the search space down here was maybe, say, in this case, probably, say, 20 parameters. Right? Maybe 10 values each, right? So that's um, 10 to the power of 20, right? Yeah. And then uh, same, let's say the same thing here. If you did it all flat, you'd have um, 10 to the power of 100 up there, right? But because you filtered it down, that 10 to the 20 um, designs gets compressed, literally compressed, into maybe 50 designs. So 10 to the 20 into 50, 10 to the 20 into 50, 10 to the 20 into 50. They get merged. You've got maybe 50 or 70 designs here. 50 here, 50 here, right? And then when it's looking at the combinations of those, it's only 50 times 50 times 70, let's say, right? So instead of uh, 10 to the power of 100 here, you've got a thousand, a design space of a thousand designs, right? So it radically compresses the space, right? So think of this from a deep learning perspective, right? Um, if you're, right now, everyone is optimizing this thing flat, right? With, say, a million parameters, right? And it's taking you a day on a big cluster, right? But instead, what you could be doing is optimizing the trade-offs at the lowest levels, where you, you, you merge this, and you merge this, and you merge this. Maybe you've got 100 designs, 100 designs, 100 designs. So instead of a million to the power, sorry, 10 to the power of a million up here, you've got maybe 10,000, right? It's 100 orders of magnitude smaller. Right? So no one has done this, because this field is kind of Within engineering disciplines, traditional ones like electrical engineering and mechanical, this is why we don't see this in AI, but that's why actually I see that it can be really useful to share with you. Um, so let's talk about animals, right? So as I was thinking about this, actually, I, I've been thinking about this going back to the early 2000s, and I was hanging out at Santa Fe Institute in about 2002, and hanging out with an evolutionary biologist, and I, I was asking myself, like, how do we get to designs? And it felt that there must be hierarchy involved somehow, right? And the question I ask here is, you know, how do you evolve a 37 trillion cell animal, right? And by the way, one of the arguments for the, um, for the existence of God is that it's not possible to um, design something that radically complex. Therefore, there must have been intervention by some greater force, some deity, right? And my answer is, that's if you're assuming a flat hierarchical methodology, right? But if you've actually got hierarchy with top-down or bottom-up design, then you radically compress the difficulty of the design. And it turns out, when hanging with this biologist um, more than 15 years ago, that he described it to me and exactly the process. So here's the process. I call it bottom-up ossification. So you start off with a single-cell organism, right? Some good old DNA, right? And um, it, so it's going along, going along, going along. And then um, it actually um, starts to get more complex, right? So that there, I'm not sure if that's still a single cell, but it's a little bit more complex. So it's got kind of this lower level, which is just the DNA, and then this higher level, which looks like it's got some mitochondria or something going on, right? 
And then basically, um, it takes this, and these become building blocks in this, right? And this is so long ago that I actually forget the terms of all this stuff. But basically, you have a lower level, and then those become building blocks at one level up, right? So we're starting to see this is like tadpole type levels of complexity, right? So this is combining many um, building blocks below, right? And then we keep going, right? So we have um, higher and higher levels of complexity where the building blocks from the lower levels start leading to the higher and higher levels, right? And so just like ourselves as humans, right? Um, I'm an overall human, I think, anyway. Um, maybe I'm a zombie, but that's for another talk. Um, but I'm, an, I'm a human, but inside myself, I've got these various systems, right? I've got my nervous system, I've got my circulatory system, and so on. And within each system, say circulatory, I have my heart, I have my, my blood vessels, I have um, the, the veins and, and everything that is pumping my heart all around, right? That is moving my blood around. And each system is like that, right? And then within my heart, it also has sub-blocks. So that there is a hierarchy inside every one of us. And the amazing thing is that this is actually how evolution worked. We started with single cell organisms, went to multi-cell, went to multi-cell, um, bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually leading to, well, um, these ape-like creatures that we have here, right? So, and uh, basically, the way to think about it is, um, back to sort of the engineering charts, it's two levels at a time are evolving or getting optimized, right? Um, so you start with the lower level, optimizing, 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 and then this one starts to optimize, and this one starts to freeze. It starts to ossify less and less and less. And then we go up. We go up, and um, this one optimizes with this one here, right? And this one has frozen. So this is why, you know, we don't see very, very much mutation at the actual level of the structure of DNA itself. Yes, the values inside DNA change, but the structure of DNA itself has been around for millions of years, right? And in some ways, even the levels above the DNA, those really aren't changing very much. So um, I can summarize now. Hierarchical design methodologies, I told you it's a method, enable ridiculously complicated designs, right? In machine learning, in engineering, and in nature, right? They are structured not ad hoc. So we've got things like top-down constraint-driven design, right? You're going from the top, you're adding constraints, adding constraints, you end up with a design. Or we can go bottom-up, right? Um, building blocks to bigger and bigger building blocks, but it's not arbitrarily adding building blocks. There's actually structure to that, right? With multi-objective multi feasibility models, this sort of thing, right? And more. So um, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about neural network training, so I had to put one final line. Are you ready for neural networks that are 1,000 x bigger, 1 million x bigger? And you know, if any of you want to go and evolve a car, come talk to me. Thank you.